This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello, Jean-Jacques Rousseau said that we differ from the animal kingdom in two main ways, the use of language and the prohibition of incest. Language, and our ability to learn it, has been held up traditionally as our species' most remarkable achievement, marking us apart from the animals. But in the 20th century, our ideas about how language is formed are being radically challenged and altered. To discuss how and why, I'm joined by Dr Jonathan Miller, Britain's most celebrated polymath. He started a career in medicine because of his interest in language. Since then, he's been a performer, a broadcaster, an author, which he still is, of course, a film and opera director. He's just curated his first art exhibition, Mirror Image, at London's National Gallery. And Professor Stephen Pinker, one of the world's leading cognitive scientists and also one of its most controversial, who's radically rewritten how we view language in the 20th century. Currently Professor of Psychology and Director of the Centre for Neuroscience at Massachusetts Institute for Technology. His books most recently, How the Mind Works and the Language Instinct, promote his vision of a computational theory of the mind and the innateness of language. Stephen Pinker, you claim that language is innate. Let's start with a basic building block, like your colleague at MIT, um, um, Chomsky. How do you prove that it is innate? Uh, you have to establish it with many different kinds of evidence because there isn't any single uh, discovery that establishes it uh, completely. For starters, uh, one has to ask how particular languages are learned. Obviously, no individual language can be innate. English isn't innate. Japanese isn't innate. Nonetheless, in order for the child to acquire English or Japanese, they can't just repeat back sentences like a, a parrot. They have to analyze it into units that they can then recombine to express brand new ideas. And I think the, any attempt to simulate language acquisition, say as a computer program or as a mathematical model, always has to build in at least some assumptions about what are the units in language worth paying attention to, and that's how the child gets off the ground, by listening to speech and looking for things like nouns and verbs and subjects and objects as the uh, patterns worth paying attention to. You're saying language is part of what we have, just as we have something in the brain which makes the muscles work. We have something in the brain which makes language work. That's right. I think we, there's a, uh, the, the brain develops a circuitry that's optimized for extracting words and grammatical rules from uh, parental speech. I think you also see evidence for it in the uh, universal design of language, that uh, the 6,000 languages spoken across the planet aren't just any old uh, computational systems, but they're built according to a common plan. What's the uh, common plan, briefly? Uh, that there are uh, words which are arbitrary pairings between a sound and a meaning, which are composed of things like vowels and consonants, which themselves don't have meaning, but which can be ordered in different ways to multiply out the set of words that uh, you can have in a language. That there are rules for combining the words, and the uh, words are categorized into uh, grammatical part of speech categories, such as noun and verb. They have roles that express who did what to whom by being labeled as subjects and objects. There are um, mechanisms for inflecting words, that is, modifying them according to their role in the sentence. So this is over 6,000 languages. Jonathan Miller, what's your view of the innateness well, I, of language? I, I, I can't help quoting uh, someone I met in the United States some years ago, Lila Gleitman, who said that uh, if a visitor were to come to the earth, it or he or she would be struck by the fact that the various languages which we think of as so separate, so different, and so difficult to learn once you're trying to acquire a second language would simply appear to him like dialects of the same language. But, as Steve was saying, they have a common design structure, which I think are not so much the result of our having language inside us, but that language is built onto certain fundamental inherited assumptions about the way the world is. The world contains things which act, things which are acted upon, um, and uh, in a sense language is structured upon certain structural assumptions that we have and we better have about how the world is, otherwise we wouldn't do very well in it. Is there any way of calculating, perhaps this is a silly question, is there any way of calculating when it became innate? I mean, at what stage in our evolution it became innate? You can put a, a late boundary on it, and that's because uh, all of the uh, cultures and ethnic groups in the world have 
as far as we know, identical language abilities. They began to split apart, uh, say, 50,000 years ago at the latest, and that's when they stopped interbreeding until just the last couple of hundred years. And so unless you had massive parallel evolution in the different branches of humanity, it's a good bet that the language ability was in place before our species fragmented, before the New Guineans went to New Guinea and uh, so on. So that would put 50,000 years as the late boundary. In terms of the early boundary, that's obviously much uh, harder. There have been attempts to reconstruct the uh, evolution of language from the uh, anatomical signs that it left behind in skeletons, things like the um, diameter of the canal that carries the nerve to the tongue, the diameter of the canal in the bone that carries the nerve that controls the uh, breathing apparatus, each of which has uh, been modified in the course of evolution, presumably in the service of the control over the breath and the tongue that's necessary for language. Yeah, I've never been convinced by that particular, by the anatomical argument, because it... it uh, it goes against the idea of the arbitrariness of the sign and uh, because, in fact, one is constantly struck by the fact that if, when people are disabled, that they can make themselves understood. For example, laryngectomy patients can do uh, uh, speech by burping and they can articulate it and pe people can speak with severe injuries to the jaw and to the tongue. Um, so it makes one feel that the linguistic ability must be some sort of abstract structure yeah. which can make use of whatever there is and you can see the extraordinary eloquence of the deaf when using sign which makes it look as if it's something upstream of the anatomical capabilities of the larynx or the tongue or the jaw and I think when people go searching for whether the larynx is high enough up the neck to allow these sort of uh, flows of sound and flows of air um, I think they're looking at the wrong thing. I so what should they be looking at, and where do you well, think it does begin? I, I don't think you can look in where it's uh, implemented, because we don't have the soft tissues of uh, pre-Pleistocene brains to look at. Um, nor do we know enough about how brains are organized now to be able to say how it happens. I mean, we talk about these areas which are not exactly responsible for language, but certainly are vulnerable uh, linguistically, where when... Uh, you know, with a broker's area, so-called. When that goes, people lose the capacity to utter speech in a certain way. In certain areas of the temporal lobe go, people lose the capacity to understand language. Now, that's really all we know. People can uh, sort of cut sections to their heart's content, and, and we still can't see from the circuitry um, how it does it. If that's so, Stephen Binker, what argument, what hard argument can you bring to bear against a a hypothesis that language began by people reacting to things, grunts of fear turned into words which said run, uh, as it were. That's a ridiculous thing. But that sort of thing. Is there any, given what Jonathan said, which seems to me to be quite convincing, is there any reason why that could not have been the start of it, rather than it being this word innate, which is a beguiling, almost magical word, almost sort of divine word? Well, those two ideas aren't incompatible, mm -hmm. because even if it's innate in modern Homo sapiens, it, may have ha it must have had some kind of origin in our evolutionary uh, ancestors, and that origin could have been a conversion of calls such as uh, for fear or warning and affiliation and so on. We certainly know now that the um, uh, calls and uh, equivalents of animal calls that, are st that we still have, moaning, sighing, laughing, uh, shouting in pain and so on, are controlled by different parts of the brain than the ones that control uh, voluntary articulate speech and that even uh, that attempts to get primates to communicate have been quite unsuccessful at getting them to control the vocal apparatus. So it's reason to at least be puzzled as to what the origin is. The obvious thing would be that language would come out of these calls and grunts, but they seem to be to have nothing to do with one another, at least in the modern human brain. Right. What about the brain, uh, Jonathan? Is there found in the mechanism of the brain uh, something in which this is located, which you feel is, is, has always been there? Or? No, no. I mean, all that we know is something about the vulnerability of the brain. And I think it was the great... Uh, pioneer neurologist Jackson who said that one mustn't uh, confuse vulnerability with responsibility. The fact that when you knock something out that certain uh, linguistic capabilities are injured doesn't mean that the part that you've knocked out is responsible for broadcasting those capabilities. It's obviously a massively interconnected network which is vulnerable at certain points. Um, and at the moment we really have the very, very vaguest idea of, of, of the actual implementation of it. But that doesn't mean that therefore we have to go looking for something else. It can't be imp implemented by anything other than brain unless you start to invoke all sorts of uh, weird 
uh, sort of psychic substances, which they did, of course, at the time of Descartes. You know, they thought there was out of spirits uh, and things. I think that's absolutely right, although it's changing now that we have new technologies for functional neuroimaging, and I think in the next uh, five years there are going to be some interesting discoveries about parts of the brain that we may not have looked at so far based on the literature from brain damage, but which may turn out to play an important role in language. Well, I think that's certainly true that neural imaging shows that there are more parts involved than we thought before. I mean, the, the, the progress is often equated with technical discoveries, but uh, the funny thing is that Chomsky's revolution... Um, was achieved without looking at the brain at all, and it was achieved by be having a new approach to the subject, in other words, to language. But in, a, in effect, a comparable approach to language was already fairly firmly in place by the 17th century as a result of these strange uh, Jansenists in, outside Paris, the Port Royal linguistic philosophers, who were actually proposing that there was, in fact, some sort of native structure to language. Now, in a sense... Um, what Chomsky did in the 1950s and 60s could have been done by the Port Royal people in the 1670s because both of them had the same material to look at, which was simply how do we talk and what is the structure of language. And I think that although it's interesting to see what's going to happen in the brain, I think that the big advance has been the result of listening more carefully to what we do when we talk to one another. Yeah, but what, when we talk, what's the, what, is there a clash, you see, Jonathan, between culture and biology? And what, I mean, just to chuck in a couple of little things. We know that uh, the young, young boy in Russia brought up with wolves and the young girl <laughs> brought up with chickens. They, they, they only were able to communicate with the sounds and reflexes they'd heard from these, these animals. Does that tell you anything about the culture of passing on language? Well, I mean, it tells us what Steve said at the beginning, that people don't inherit Japanese what they in, or English or French. In order to, um, uh, to be competent performers of one or other of those, they must be exposed to it. But um, they, they wouldn't be competent performers of it unless they had this innate capacity mm. to acquire language very rapidly, much more rapidly than it could possibly be explained by sort of trial and error learning. But that's not, I think, where the... Uh, the controversy arises between culture and biology. I mean, we know linguistically that this is... So where do, you, where do you see the centre of that controversy between culture and biology? Well, I think that, and this is where I think Steve and I differ to some extent, I think that there has been a sort of vast trade of evolutionary psychology, which I think has overstressed the extent to which we are, in fact, creatures of our heredity, rather than creations of our culture as well. Yeah. I, I would see the, uh, our discussion of language as being a model for how to look at the interaction of biology and culture elsewhere, namely that what biology gives us is an ability to learn in certain ways, to pay attention to certain aspects of the environment and ignore others, to have certain goals, to analyze the world in certain categories. And just as we don't inherit Japanese, but we inherit an ability to acquire a range of languages that includes Japanese, we might inherit a way of uh, parsing the cultural world to pay attention to certain aspects of behavior, to be able to learn certain things easily and certain things uh, not at all. Um, so I, I don't even like thinking of biology and culture as two complementary ingredients because they're really different categories. Uh, culture is one of the things that happens when you have a, an innate learning ability in a species and then you let the members of the species um, interact and bump into each other, and culture is what uh, emerges as a result of that interaction. No, but I think that there has been a frightful disparagement on the part of people who have perhaps drunk too deeply at the wells of neurobiology, a disparagement of what, for example, one uh, couple of authors, Tubi and Cosmedes, have attacked as the standard social science research model, indicating that social studies and sociology are sort of derelict enterprises and that if only sociologists were to direct their attention towards, uh, for example, game theory and uh, to genetics and uh, notions of inclusive fitness and so forth, we'd have the human sciences down to a T. And I think it's a philistine approach to the extraordinary varieties of culture. Of course they co-evolve in some way, but I don't think that culture is on this sort of short leash of hereditary compulsion, which some people imply. Uh, it, leaves, it, it leaves the study of history in a state of, uh, of derelict shame, really. <laughs> I, I just don't think it's, it's right.
Stephen Minka. Uh, yeah, I, I think of it differently. I don't. The uh, the leash metaphor isn't particularly appealing. Um, I think of it more as the that uh, the biology provides the uh, the elements and the rules of combination. Perhaps it's the rules of chess and culture as the actual as a particular game of chess, uh, and that. Uh, it's not so much that the social sciences are derelict enterprises, but just that uh, they, they shouldn't float free of the rest of knowledge, in particular knowledge of science, that ultimately they should be connected to the natural sciences via an understanding of human nature and the innate learning abilities that give rise to culture when you watch people interact over uh, large spans of time. I've had a sneak preview of your uh, forthcoming books, you make a words and rules, the ingredients of language, and you talk about the combinatorial system of language. That was first put forward in the Enlightenment. Um, can you tell us why you think that is so extraordinary? The extraordinary thing about language is the vast range of thoughts that we can communicate. It's not just that we have a list of a dozen messages that we can bark at each other, but we can talk to each other about theories of the origin of the universe or the latest twists and turns in the Monica Lewinsky scandal or the football scores or soap opera plots or cosmological systems. Uh, what's the secret behind our trick to convey so many different kinds of ideas? <clears throat> and I think the secret is combinatorics, that what language allows us to do is take a, a fixed stock of ideas, the ones that we have words for, but then to combine them in phrases and sentences in which the meaning of the sentence can be computed from the meanings of the words and the way that they're arranged. Because the number of messages grows geometrically or exponentially with the length of a sentence, it means that you can get truly enormous numbers of thoughts that can be expressed, even with a finite set of tools, as long as the tools allow for combining the nouns and verbs into bigger uh, strings. But there are lunatic statistics, are there, that uh, uh, in 20 word sentences you can have 100 million trillion uh, variations of a 20 word sentence, and this is more than the double the second since the universe began, something idiotic like that. <laughs> yes, yes, many orders of magnitude more. Uh, and it's just simply because of the mathematics of uh, combinatorics, you can get mind numbers. So where does that lead numbers. us? I mean, it's, uh, you can't get your mind around it, but where does it lead us? It's such a, why is there that vastness, that infinity? How, how, how do you not account for that? What does that say to you? Um, it, it, it reflects back on the thoughts that we put into language, the reason that we have this mechanism for converting thoughts into so many different noises is that we have so many different thoughts to begin with. And I think that the, uh, perhaps even the essence of human intelligence is to be able to imagine brand new scenarios, to put things together that uh, other members of the species haven't put together before. Language is just the medium by which we share those combinatorial thoughts. So it's a way of taking combinatorial thoughts and converting them into combinatorial noises so that we can get them from one head into another. But it also creates the possibility of having thoughts which were not actually conceivable before, not just simply expressible. Yes. And it may well be that, I mean, I think Forster once said, I don't quite know what I think until I hear myself say it. Now, there is a sense in which new thoughts get created as a result of utterances of an unprecedented form. Um, which goes back to really what I was arguing earlier, that if, in fact, there is this vast combinatorial possibility, and I think von Humboldt pointed it out, the possibility of using r limited resources to express an infinite series of thoughts, and uh, that was already in place at the beginning of the 19th century, um, in a way that reinforces what I was saying about the autonomy of culture, that if, in fact, using this biologically inherited device of a of a vastly combinatorial system which allows us to express infinitely more than was previously thought to be possible, then it does start to float free of its biological basis. It still is it's anchored in it, but nevertheless it becomes possible to create a cultural artifact which is entirely within the medium of language, which actually transcends what was previously thought to be possible on the, on the basis of its biology. Is this actually bringing in the imagination? No, the imagination is a sort of loose and rather unfocused uh, concept, which perhaps includes some of these things. Um, but uh, I think that it indicates the autonomy of what, in fact, begins to appear in language. Well, there are different ways of, lo of, of I guess, looking at the, the same phenomenon, because we agree mm -hmm. what the phenomenon is. Uh, it is autonomous in the sense that any particular idea can be thought for the first time and, and communicated for the first time, although the elements and rules of combination that allow us to have those thoughts are, in a, in a sense, specified by the mental apparatus that we inherit. 
And indeed, even an infinite combinatorial apparatus doesn't cover everything, just as the integers are infinite, but they don't include the fractions. A, an infinite combinatorial scheme for having thoughts also leaves possible there's certain kinds of thoughts that we can't think or have great difficulty thinking, even though the ones that we can think are, as you point out, open-ended and infinitely creative. But it is interesting how thoughts which perhaps at the time th seemed unthinkable, I mean, one knows, for example, that Newton virtually bust his head trying to think of the mathematical concepts, which enabled him then to think uh, to the point where he could create the Principia. Um, now, um, a pretty smart first-year physics student finds the Principia, which was almost unreadable by more than two or three of Newton's contemporaries, he finds it perfectly easy to understand it. So that this creates as this, this vast autonomous mathematical culture, and I think that language also creates this enormous on autonomous culture in which we speak to one another, although, of course, it's rooted in biology. How else, where else can it be rooted? What part does philosophy play in this? A lot of philosophers believe that philosophy is just the... Uh, sort of advancing edge of science and that the problems that the scientists think aren't worth thinking about yet are the ones that the philosophers uh, worry about. As soon as they start to get answered, the philosophers get bored with them and they slough them off to, to the sciences. There are also, though, some problems that traditional philosophical problems that don't seem to be yielding to science, and these might even be examples of the unthinkable thoughts that our combinatorial apparatus for cognition just leaves out. And I, uh, in, in How the Mind Works, I reiterate an argument from Colin McGinn that some of the uh, mysteries that haven't become less mysterious over time, the ones where you and I could have a debate with, uh, with Aristotle and mm. uh, we would be on, speaking on the same terms, may be uh, cases where uh, the very nature of thought doesn't allow us to see a problem from the right perspective. It's thought that perhaps the problem of, of sentient subjective experience, why does neural firings give rise to something that I actually experience as redness and pain and saltiness, mm. could be a kind of problem where limitations of our own brain never allow us to be mm. completely satisfied with any answer. We know that it must be the physiology of the brain that gives rise yes, to the sensation else, yeah. of saltiness, but what uh, bridges that gap between the physical and the subjective may be something that we don't have the mental categories to appreciate. And yet, you see, there are these sort of radical eliminativists, both the East and West Coast in the United States, who think that they're really that consciousness and redness and saltiness and uh, fear and so forth are epiphenomena, and that what's really going on is brain writing, and that once we get brain writing down, we'll have got it. Um, and uh, then you wonder what they do when they're off duty, these people, when they're getting redness and saltiness and fear and lust and so forth. But I agree with Colin McGinn and in fact, the others that there may be some sort of fundamental mystery about how it is that grey, salty porridge, by firing electrically, can make the owner of the grey, salty porridge see red. What role do you think the unconscious uh, plays in language, Stephen Pinker? Well, uh, most of language processing is unconscious. None of us has a, uh, any idea what the rules are that allow us to string words together in well-formed sentences to make ourselves understood. Uh, so uh, I think with most cognitive processes, what we experience subjectively is, is a tip of the iceberg. And it's an interesting scientific question why certain aspects of the process should be things that we can talk about and ruminate about and reflect back on while the rest goes on uh, beneath the surface. It needn't be Freud's answer that what goes on beneath the surface is... Um, uh, socially unacceptable or too painful to witness. There may be good engineering reasons why you want to have some subset of the information processing in the brain sort of mutually available so that the language system can talk about some aspects of the perceptual system and the decision-making system has access to the results of those computations where the rest you farm out to autonomous processes that can just spin away in their black boxes and not bother these other parts of the brain. Yeah, you see, I think that the um, the popularization of the Freudian unconscious has actually done almost uh, irreparable harm to the more interesting unconscious with which people like Chomsky deal, and others, you see. Um, and the funny thing is that the whereas Freud's notion of the unconscious is a custodial, repressive one, in which you keep things under lock and key because you don't want to hear them talked about and because they're dangerous and subversive and disruptive to society. But actually, long before the Freudian unconscious was developed, a much more interesting, what I would describe as a, a, an 
as an enabling unconscious, the, conscious, the unconsciousness that, that allows us to do things like speaking or sleeping on a problem and coming up with it next morning, uh, remembering things um, uh, uh, surprisingly after a, lot, after a journey, suddenly remember, oh yes, I had seen that, I had seen that, there's a vast amount of stuff. Now, this notion of the enabling unconscious was already in place by the 1870s. There were two scientists in England, William Benjamin Carpenter at University College and Thomas Laycock, who had actually already formulated a notion of what was called then either the reflex functions of the brain or a wonderful clumsy term called unconscious cerebration. Um, so that the idea of an enabling unconscious was, was fully in place until the Freudian unconscious, um, with all its sort of naughty connotations of Freudian slips and naughty thoughts, replaced it in the public imagination. And actually, if it hadn't, I think, been for behaviorism in the 1920s, the enabling unconscious, which was already formulated by the end of the 19th century, would have actually brought the cognitive revolution into existence long before it did. As it was, we had to endure this ghastly drought of behaviorism. We're watching um, rats running mazes and uh, you know, giving monkeys rewards and punishments and stop people thinking cognitively. Finally, can I ask you, Stephen Pinkett, with street language and uh, street slang and computer language and different scientific languages growing, do you, just, do you see more and more languages? We, we talk about the disappearance of languages as the disappearance of certain tribes and cultures. Do you see more and more languages evolving, more complex and more different? Uh, certainly, uh, within a language such as English, uh, we... we uh, mourn the loss of certain words, the distinction between uh, lie and lay, the distinction between uh, you know, infer and imply and disinterested and uninterested. But new words are being bred all the time to uh, maintain the richness and the diversity. Uh, unfortunately, they, it, it is something that will be preserved in English, which won't replace the vast number of languages in New Guinea and Russia and Alaska and Africa and so on that will be lost. So there is an increase in diversity within a language, but a loss of different languages. When we lose those languages, uh, finally, finally, in uh, those places, are we losing something valuable, or are we losing, as Jonathan said earlier in the program, a dialect? Uh, no, I think we're lo losing something very precious. I mean, it's like lo losing a species. Mm -hmm. Uh, that each language is uh, a, uh, an astonishingly rich and beautiful system mm. that captures something about the uh, culture of the people that speaks them, and it's a, a great tragedy for the species. I, I, I did say there were dialects only to Martians. Yes, and I, I, sl I, I slapped myself on the knuckles for saying only a dialect, as I spent quite a bit of time trying to preserve the, <laughs> the dialect of, of the northwest of England, the extreme northwest of England, uh, which is a great loss to civilization. Thank you very much, Stephen Finger and Jonathan Miller, and thank you for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.